Hello everyone, my name is Laurent Ben Sliman and I'm the principal bass clarinet of the Philharmonia Orchestra. In this guy today I'm going to tell you how the bass clarinet works and what it is made of and give you some information about its history. Then I'm going to play some few excerpts you could find the bass clarinet, whether the bass clarinet's got an important role in the orchestra. And also I'm going to tell you about a few, few techniques you can employ on the bass clarinet. The bass clarinet is part of a huge family. I mean, you've got over a dozen different clarinets. So going from the A flat, which is about that big, to the octo contrabass, which is about twice as big as, as the bass clarinet. And uh, most of the clarinets, bass clarinets, are made of African hardwood, which we call blackwood or grenadier. The bass clarinet is made of five different parts. So, so we're going to start from the bottom. From the bottom, you have the bell, which is generally in metal. So then you put what we call the lower joint, which is the longest one of the, of the two. So you, you put it together like that. Then on top of that, you attach what we call the upper joint, which is the shorter one of the two. Together like that, make sure it's well lined up here. Then you put what you call the crook, which is in metal as well, the same as, as the bell. And finally, you have the mouthpiece. You put on the crook like that, make sure every, everything is aligned. And also to avoid to put the bell directly on the floor, we have the spike, so you've got different shape, different materials, but you put that there. It's really important for the sound as well, because if you have the bell directly on the floor, it kills all the, the low harmonics you want to keep. If I blow like that without anything on the mouthpiece, I'm, I'm not getting any sound. What you need for that, it's what we call a reed. So reeds are made of, of cane. They have different shapes, um, different strength, I mean, different sizes rather than different shapes to, to, to fit to different math pieces. That's a piece of cane, rectangular shape, rounded at the top. So you put that on the mouthpiece like that. That's what we call the ligature. It's going to hold the reed on the mouthpiece. And now, if you take off the mouthpiece, just to show you what the sound is without the rest of the instrument, that's not going to be very really nice. So that's the sound without the rest of the bass line it. And now, the sound is made thanks to the reed vibrating. You're going to blow through the instrument and doing that, the reed is going to vibrate, it's going to create the sound. The pitch is going to change when you're going to press down the keys. If it's all open, the air goes out here. So that means the length of the tube is from there to there. So if I'm going to press down the keys one by one until the, low, the lowest note of the bass line, eight, which is the C, and you're going to see the sound is going to go down slowly, gradually. Until you reach the lower C, which means the length of the tube compared to a G, it's a lot longer. So the air goes there and out here. The bass line is what we call a transposing instrument. That means on my part, there's a, a written C. You're not going to hear a C, you're going to hear a B flat. That's why my bass line and the soprano clarinet are in B flat. That means when we play a C, that sounds like a B flat. In order to get more work in orchestras, it's always nice to have a, a doubling instrument. If you can play the three of them, it's even better. But 
I've always been attracted by low instruments like bass guitar, cellos. When I was studying in Tours in France before, when I moved to Paris, my clarinet teacher was also the principal bass clarinet of the Paris Opera. So I wanted to learn with him. I wanted to have his sound. I thought his sound was absolutely fantastic. And that was probably the best decision of my life to, to do that because here I am today, I'm principal bass of the Philharmonic Orchestra. I couldn't really dream for a better job in a better orchestra. All the keys are padded. That's the difference between the bass clarinet and the, all the other clarinets mainly. It's because the holes are too big for my fingers to, to cover them. And then you've got keys extension to reach the bottom part of the bass clarinet. If I press that key, you can see it goes until there, which otherwise without this extension, I would have to do it myself, which is not very easy. And you've got also, it goes the lowest key, because I can activate with the thumb, just move that bottom pad. Playing the bass clarinet, it's probably the easiest of all the clarinets, because even if it's quite heavy, I've got absolutely no weight resting on my, on my thumb because of, of the spikes. It rests on the floor with the spike, so I can play for hours and I, I never have any problem with my right thumb. You could also have, if you want to move on stage, if you want to walk, if you play jazz music or, or anything like that, you could have straps as well. And what you can do as well, if you don't have to move that much when you play, you can custom made a, a long spike like that one. That means you, you can play standing up with absolutely no weight on your thumb. That's good if you want to play a concerto, I mean, where you don't need to move around. That's absolutely perfect. When you buy the bass line, it comes with a spike, which is the same size, bit of metal, but instead of having the spike directly on the floor, we've got a piece of rubber here. So that, that's the standard spike. That spike is actually made by uh, a Japanese maker, and uh, he started making cello spikes because for cellos, I mean, for all the st strings instruments like cellos and double basses, the type of spike is very important because it has direct contact with the floor. And the material is, is very important as well because uh, it changes the sound. I couldn't believe it the first time I found out about these spikes, I thought that's a uh, a geeky thing and it's not going to change anything. And actually it does because when you blow into your instrument, the vibration, the harmonics, everything has direct contact with the floor. For me, it would be quite easy to play the saxophone because it's, it's the same mouthpiece, roughly the, I mean, the same shape. That's the same type of reeds. That's a single reed. I would struggle much more if I had to play the oboe or bassoon because it's, it's double width, so it's, it's a completely different embouchure. Quite often, you also have to double on clarinet, on the soprano clarinet, B flat or A clarinet. So you have parts written for second clarinet doubling bass or third clarinet doubling bass. Obviously, having a, a good a good level on, on the on the soprano clarinet is is also very important because. You, you could have some tricky parts to play on the clarinet as well in doubling on the bass. And now also in modern music, I mean, you could also come across a part for bass clarinet doubling contrabass clarinet. And it happened recently when we played uh, S.A.P. Castellan's uh, cello concerto. You have to be ready to play either smaller instruments or much bigger instruments. The articulations on the bass line, they're exactly the same. We can do exactly the same as we do on, the, on any other woodwind instrument, any other clarinet. You can play legato, you can play long staccato, short staccato. So I'm just going to play you a scale with the, the three different ones. For example, start legato, and then long detaché, and then, and then staccato.
If you play in a symphonic orchestra, you're going to often play with the low sections of the orchestra, like double basses, cellos, contrabassoon, tuba. I mean, all the instruments are, they've got a massive sound together. When you have eight double basses and 10 cellos, it's, it's about 20 people you have to play with. When you have unisons with them, you want to match their juicy, meaty sound. You don't want the bass line at the back of the orchestra sounding very bright and not nice. So the main thing for me is the sound. It's very important to get a beautiful sound on the bass line. So to achieve that, you can use your B flat on Boucher, which for me doesn't work. That's why you, you can see me when I'm playing, having air in my cheeks. And if I use my normal on Boucher on the bass line, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do that. The sound is tiny and squeaky, and if I keep the same embouchure as my B flight line at embouchure, I would put my teeth, upper teeth, right there on the patch, and roughly my bottom lip here on the, on the, on the reed. My embouchure on the bass line, I put my teeth right up there on the mouthpiece. And my bottom lip, I would say, is roughly around there. So having more lip and having more mouthpiece is going to give me a much bigger and better sound. If I use my embouchure, you're going to hear the difference. So it gives you more volume. You can do some growling, you can do some uh, multiphonic. I mean, I can't, I can't show you some, some of them. I mean, growling could make some kind of noise like that. So you have that. You could have, uh, what can we do, some multiphonics as well, which are easier on the bottom note. Another effect you can you could do on, on the bass line, it's, it's singing as well as playing. And actually it's a good exercise to relax the throat. So I'm gonna try to do it. Your throat here it should be absolutely 100% relaxed and try to, to open as much as you can and, and then you can have the different multiphonics. I'm now going to play the first movement of the Manfred Symphony by Tchaikovsky. You can start from nowhere and it's just beautiful. I'm now going to play an excerpt from the Violin Concerto by Shostakovich. In this excerpt, you have to be impeccable about the rhythm. You can't move one inch either way, because it has to be in perfect unison with the flute. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
that's one of the biggest solos ever written for bass clarinet in terms of length. It's in the low register of the bass clarinet and it's long phrases. So you have to use a lot of air. You have to just take massive breath every time you have a chance to do it. The next excerpt I'm going to play to you is The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. It's one of the few pieces written for two bass clarinets. I'm going to play a few bits of both bass clarinet parts. <laughs> the part I just played was the second clarinet part. So now I'm going to play the exact same few bars, but I'm going to add the first bass line it part and it should be just one line. So now this excerpt is also from the, the Rite of Spring and uh, I chose it because it's for a different reason. It's just a unison with the E flat clarinet. So that's tricky for us to for an obvious reason, which is the intonation. So I'm just going to give you the bass line at line. Obviously, it's, it's more challenging when you have the E flat part on top of it. So I'm now going to play uh, an excerpt from Don Quixote by Richard Strauss. Why this excerpt? It's just a funny one because uh, the euphonium is part of the brass section normally sitting over there. But this one is really interesting because the euphonium and the bass line, and the, they've got a lot of solos together. So for that reason, the euphonium will sit most of the time uh, on your right. <laughs>
Well, if you want to play the bass clarinet first, you have to be able to play the clarinet because that's the same fingerings. That's more or less the same way of blowing. You really have to focus on being a good clarinet player first. The only thing you have to learn specifically for the bass line, it's, it's the bass clef. <laughs> you have to sort that out before even touching the instrument. I mean, just practice without the instrument, but the bass clef is really, really important. Actually, you've got two models of bass line. It's, you've got the one like mine, it goes to the low C, which is slightly longer, and the one we usually use in a symphonic orchestra. You could have slightly shorter bass line, it goes to the E flat, which is these notes. And mine's got just three extra notes, the D, D flat, and C. But bass line going to the low E flat are much easier to, to blow for younger players, so that could be an option. So then you've got also different materials. I mean, all the professionals will play on a wooden one, but you can get also um, cheaper version in resin, which is much lighter and easier to blow as well. I would say you have to service your baseline, I mean, ideally once a year, and then you have to do a major service, I would say. It depends how much you play, obviously, but for me, I would say every five years, four or five years, I would do a complete service, which means taking everything apart. All the, all the keys are off and it's back to bare wood, literally. Just, uh, just the wood, oiling the wood and then put all the, the keys back, changing all the pads, oiling all the keys. I mean, unfortunately, our, our instruments, I mean, you can't keep them forever because uh, when you, you choose an instrument, the outside doesn't really matter. We all have the same keys. When we want to buy a new instrument, it's the bore, the inside. But unfortunately, after hours and days and months and years of playing on it, the, the bore inside is, is changing, is moving. At some point, it loses its focus. It loses the, the, the grain of the sun you, you like. So you have to change them regularly. Thanks for watching this video. If you have any questions, of course, you can put a comment and ask me anything if you need. I hope you enjoyed it.